This is Artists at Work, and I'm your host, Andrew Pa. With me today is Dr. Jerry Wong from Kent State University, where he's a professor of piano um, and is also a Steinway artist. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Um, so I'd uh, like to start off the conversation with talking about where, how you got your start in music. Um, you know, it's always interesting. You know, for me it was, I started in fifth grade. But for you, kind of let us, uh, how'd you get your start? Sure. Uh, my mother is uh, very much uh, who I, I owe my start to. She's, she's so, or I could say she's the culprit, I guess, who got, got <laughs> all this going. Um, she was a pianist herself. She mm. studied, um, I think, quite seriously when she was young. She went to the University of Southern California, which has, of course, mm. a fantastic uh, music school. I grew yeah. out, you know, out there on the West Coast. And uh, I think she even did a bit of study at the Juilliard School. I think she kind of ran out of money in New York City and, and ended up having to move back home to California. Um, she wasn't doing a whole lot with her music career uh, when I came along. I don't know if I was the, the source that deterred her or not. I'm not quite <laughs> sure. But um, essentially, I think she decided at that point that she was going to uh, devote herself to, to raising me. I'm mm -hmm. sure it was quite a task. And she, uh, she used to play the piano a lot. So it's, it's fascinating now to hear you know, major works by uh, Beethoven, uh, Chopin, Schumann, in concerts, and I'll, I'll stop and I'll think, wow, my first introduction to these pieces was my mother practicing them, playing them really for her own pleasure. She wasn't preparing for any kind of performance whatsoever. She just played, and I would sit on the floor and, and play with Legos, and I would listen to this great literature in the background. Ultimately, she tried to show me some things at the piano, tried to uh, help me learn to read and, and play my scales. It was an, an utter disaster, of course. <laughs> it, it immediately turned into screaming matches and arguing of all kinds. You know, I thought I knew better, though I, of course, knew nothing. And, uh, but somehow, I think maybe there was a glimmer that there was some prospect there, or maybe she wanted to see that. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was about eight years old, she took me to my first uh, kind of real piano teacher, and I started formal lessons. And that went from there. I think when I was about 13 years old, I, I switched to another teacher. And that teacher really had quite a few serious students, and she entered me in lots of young piano competitions. You know, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd show up and play two short selections sometimes, a movement of a sonata or something, and, and compete for the, for the prize. And, and my mother was really great because <clears throat> every time I had a little prize money, she put it into my own separate bank account, and that, and that remained untouched and untapped until I went off to college uh, years later. Well, that's a great. I, when I was growing up, I didn't really do a lot of competitions other than like the district stuff that you do for school. Mm -hmm. um, did you do those throughout, you know, uh, even into college, or did you pretty much just do those as um, kind of a teenager? Sure. There, there's an interesting thing with music competitions. Um, they tend uh, to be somewhat local when you're at the younger age, mm -hmm. although there are obviously major international competitions for high school age students, but many of the competitions I did were local. And so it was uh, kids from Orange County, California, Los Angeles, California, we'd compete against each other. I get to know some of the stronger students pretty well. Then suddenly you're 18 years old and you're in the category of 18 to 35 <laughs> and, and the, the competition becomes more fierce. Yes, I always had um, one or two competitions that I was doing per year. I always entered the concerto competition or whatever. Uh, university or conservatory I was studying at. So competitions played a part. Um, and now as a teacher, I try to help my students prepare for competitions with the right musical and emotional mindset because mm -hmm. it, it, it puts you through something to do these kinds of things, to put your, your art out there in front of other people and, and to kind of bear your soul <laughs> in this context yeah. you know, where you're being compared to other people. Yeah. Did that... Did that, you know, doing those competitions, did that kind of fuel your drive for music? Or was it just kind of a, 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 hap, a, a perk of, being, of doing music? Did it, <clears throat> what kind of other benefits did it maybe give you? Sure, sure. Well, it's a perk when you win, obviously. <laughs> of course. It's a perk when you win. It's a boost to your, to your ego, especially at a young age when you can't separate the two things so easily. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, there are performances that can come from winning a competition, and that's, that's vital. As you build a career, that's vital. Mm -hmm. But I think very fortunately for me, um, the driving force was not the competition itself at all. It was my real deep and blossoming love for the piano literature. And I loved playing the instrument. I think it, I was a bit of a, 
of a misfit at school, so it was a nice escape <laughs> for me to sit and practice this instrument. My parents were very kind. They provided me with a good instrument. I practiced it, you know, hours on end as a teenager, really, and mm -hmm. it, it in, in, engulfed me with uh, my curiosity was there. And so, so that, that's the driving factor. And I think that actually if you're too tied to the actual act of the competition, uh, ultimately uh, there's potential disappointment down the road. Yeah, yeah. Um, so was there, you know, talking about just developing that love and of the instrument and just really falling into it, um, was there, is, do you remember a moment that you really said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life? Or was it kind of, you just, you just kind of kept going on this path and were like, well, I guess I'm here, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> anytime I could ask, or anytime my mother could ask, um, uh, a teacher or a professor with some some wisdom did I have the goods so to speak should I continue my study should I major in this um, we would ask and, and my father who was a um, uh, fairly successful independent businessman and, and had a knack for real estate always said to me you know um, kind of his attitude was a little bit when and if this fails you can come and work for me <laughs> <laughs> which was uh, both a nice safety cushion and a little bit uh, insulting when you're you know you're young and you you're you've got your own ideals anyway um i think there was a, a rather powerful moment uh, at that time in my teenage years uh, menahem pressler who was then the pianist of the very coveted and renowned beaux arts trio mm -hmm. used to come out to la every year in the fall and give master classes. And he would do two or three days of master classes. He would hear students, you know, hours on end actually. Sometimes he would do um, as many as three three-hour sessions in a day. Um, and I had the opportunity to play for him my sophomore, junior, and senior years of high school in this master classes. He had to audition to be accepted and um, I'm sure I made virtually no impression the first couple of times. But the last year was the fall of my senior year. And he took me aside and he said, uh, you've really improved, especially this last year. I've enjoyed watching your progress. And I don't know what prompted me, but when <laughs> he left, I wrote him a letter. And I said, you know, what do you think, you know, could I audition at Indiana University, which is where he was teaching. He's mm -hmm. one of the most, um, uh, one of the largest and, and most important music schools in the country. And so mm -hmm. uh, I was thrilled to hear back, not from him, but from his wife, who handled all of his managerial types of things at that time. And she said, he does remember you, and he does encourage you to apply an audition here. And ultimately, he accepted me into his studio. And, and that really was kind of a big big moment for me, and it, and it pushed me in a new direction. Yeah, yeah. What was it like, you know, so you were an East Coast, or West Coast, um, and then going to Indiana and studying yeah. at uh, yeah. Indiana yeah. University. You go from being in this rather large, populous yeah. area to yeah. Bloomington, Indiana, which yeah. is... Yeah. You know, not a lot of people yeah. around. What yeah. was, did it kind of make you redevote your, get even more devoted to the piano, yeah. or did you? It's so interesting that you ask that because, of course, you know there was the, the absence of the traffic. You know, L.A. traffic, and, you <laughs> know, absence of this this large cosmopolitan area, and uh, you know, cornfields. But this really magnificent college town, mm -hmm. and this music school where I actually met more international students than I had ever before in my life because it was drawing people mm. from all over. So you had teachers, you know, the major professors were Hungarian, Belgian, uh, uh, Russian. Uh, my teacher was German uh, by descent, but then he had uh, immigrated to Israel, so he considered himself Israeli. Mm. Uh, fascinating background. So in some ways, that isolated music school felt less provincial to be than my own upbringing in California, which was which was fairly sheltered. My parents had sheltered me quite a bit. So um, that was a fascinating thing that I think that in some ways my my thinking and my my being perhaps became a little bit more sophisticated during that time in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, but uh, Pressler was a very demanding teacher, and I spent many an hour uh, in the in the uh, practice room, isolated <laughs> and preparing for my lessons. So I, I worked pretty hard during that time to try to try to forge ahead. Yeah. I mean, I just remember, you know, when I went to undergrad, I did the same thing. My my second teacher that I had at my undergrad was incredibly he was very different from what I was used to, and mm -hmm. so I spent a lot of time that year, especially because I was also getting ready for graduate school auditions, mm -hmm. just in the practice room. And prior to that, you know, I practiced about 3 or 4 hours a day. By the time mm -hmm. I got to my senior year, it was more like 
five, six. Yes. You know, spending yes. time in the practice room. And a lot of times I was a late night practicer. So mm -hmm. I would go from like 9 yes. p.m. to 1 a.m. Yes. And then get up. And yeah. sometimes in the morning, then I would wake up and I would warm up for the day. Yep. You know, it's yep. just kind of that kind of dedication and uh, going through that. So after Indiana, you went and did master's and doctoral study. Where did you go for your master's yes. again? So uh, I moved to the East Coast, um, seemed very logical. I, I moved to Baltimore and I, I uh, did a master's degree at the Peabody Conservatory. Mm -hmm. And then I went to New York City and I did a doctoral uh, degree at Manhattan School of Music. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, those were great years. I loved it there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you went kind of from being in that you know, you felt more isolated to being in that bigger, you know, you've, you've yes. got really a lot of exposure. Did you kind of feel the same way when you ended up on the East Coast? Um, were you, or was it a little bit uh, different because now you were, exp you had more opportunities to kind of explore? When I moved to New York City, I thought and felt, I'm finally home. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. I still love it. Every time I go back, I love it. Um, it's, it's a vibrant place. It's an intense place. It's demanding, very grueling, very unforgiving. It is all those things. But um, I found people to be engaging. I found people to be friendly. And I learned so much about, about music and about who I was as a person during those years. Wonderful. Well, we're going about to listen to a clip uh, that... Oh, good. Uh, I hope I sent yeah. you something decent. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. So please enjoy this clip from Dr. Jerry Wong, um, and we'll see you in the second half.
welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that clip. So you're now, you know, after you finished all of your schooling, now you are a professor at Kent State. What did you, did you have anything in between being, um, you know, between New York and arriving in Ohio? Uh, sure, I had, I had two uh, teaching positions. Each lasted a year. I was in Northern California at a school called Humboldt State University, which is actually a five and a half hour drive from San Francisco, way up in the northern wow. part of the state. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful part of the country. And then a, a year teaching at uh, Ithaca College mm. in, in New York, which has a wonderful music school. I had a great year there. Mm -hmm. And then this position at uh, Kent State opened up, and it seemed like a good fit. And I was thrilled that they, they wanted me to, <laughs> to be with them. Yeah. So when you, you know, uh, something that's, uh, you know, I haven't gotten to discuss very much, but when you're applying for these positions at colleges, what is the kind of the interview process like as a faculty, when you're wanting to be a faculty person there, you know? Yeah. I'm sure it's, it's a bit, it can feel a bit personal because you're it's, presenting yourself as an artist and a teacher yes, and all of those things. Yes, it's, well, I mean, first of all, it can be quite grueling. The process is, is exhausting. It begins uh, with usually nothing more than a, a cover letter and a resume, detailed resume. And then sometimes after uh, the search committee has evaluated that, maybe they ask for more material, they ask you to send a teaching video or a, a video of your performances. Back when I was applying for jobs, you know, it was more just a CD of your performances, but now everyone has more capacity to video mm -hmm. record themselves. Um, and then another process of selection is made. You find out that they're calling your references. And ultimately, they usually bring about three or four people to a campus. And, and then you come and you guest teach and you meet people and you, you perform. And um, it is, you're absolutely right, it's very different. It's not just an audition anymore. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, all competitions were an audition. You walked in, you played a certain number of minutes and uh, hoped for the best. <laughs> in this instance, you have um, an opportunity. You have an opportunity to win them over with your personality, mm -hmm. with the way you speak about music, with the way you think about music, with the way that you identify with the students. Um, and they're looking very hard to see not only are you a good pianist, will you be a fine teacher, but will you work well in this environment? Will you fit with these other groups of people? Do you have the right sort of personality, the right chemistry? Yeah, so. yeah. It's such a you know, fascinating aspect of it because a lot of times people have this perception of musicians as being very isolated and and not having to work, you know, with other people as much. Especially, I think pianists, organists can sometimes get that because you can be a lot of times you're can be a much more independent yep. artist. Um, so, you know, since doing that, you you know, you've really traveled quite a bit as as, as a pianist. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been talking to some other people who are also Steinway artists. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of the, you know, the opportunities that becoming a Steinway artist opened up mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. you know. Um, did that, was that kind of the case for you or a lot of your travels to places where they have, you know, like Steinway galleries and things like that? Mm -hmm. And I know I'm sure you have other mm -hmm. projects, but does mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, it, help I, with that? I, I was really honored and, and thrilled when I became a, a Steinway artist. And um, I love, love the instrument. I have a, a, my own Steinway at home, actually. Um, Yes, and it's led to some performing opportunities. You know, the performing opportunities are very interesting. How they come, why they come. Mm -hmm. Some of it is is connections. Some of it is word of mouth. Um, and and um, you know, it's when those chances to travel and to perform and, and to share music with audiences when they come, it's it's a thrill. You know, mm -hmm. and it's a it's a great joy, and uh, I I always welcome it, for sure. Yeah. So. You actually just recently, have you completed the album yet, or are you still in the process of finalizing it? All of my part is done. You're done. <laughs> All of my part is done. I, I um, this is, uh, will be a second uh, solo CD for me, mm. and um, it's all works of Claude Debussy, mm -hmm. a famous French impressionist composer, who um, passed away exactly 100 years ago. Passed mm. away in, in 1918, which is why we're we're pushing really hard to try to get this uh, disc out before the end of this year, and, and mm -hmm. it will be um, ready to go. So in in March and in May, I did two different sessions in New York mm -hmm. and recorded a, a group of pieces that I think all uh, exemplify uh, DBC in either motion or in dance, and that was the idea, that he wrote some music that's that's very clearly a dance, and mm -hmm. another music that has, sort of represents different kinds of motion. Mm -hmm. So I, I paired all of these pieces together in a, what I think is a somewhat interesting way, and and uh, right now we're just waiting for the final edits. And, 
and then it'll be on its way. Yeah, that's uh, such an interesting process of creating an album. So you went and did two sessions. Did you, what were those like, you know, being in those sessions to record? Yeah, well, so, okay, so first of all, we, uh, this is a very interesting thing. Um, the, when you split the sessions up this way, um, you need to create the exact same environment both times. Mm -hmm. So uh, my recording engineer, Bill Sigmund, who's fantastic, actually took uh, pictures uh, at the end of the March session and made sure that he reset the stage, so to speak, or reset the recording area mm -hmm. exactly, identically the same way in May. And he took careful notes of all the things that he was doing to make sure that we had exactly the same sound quality. And then the piano itself that I selected from Steinway uh, was the same instrument for both occasions. So when I went, I went to Steinway in New York, I guess it was in December, and I said, I'm doing these two recording sessions. It has to be available on these dates. They gave me about seven different uh, Steinway D concert grants to choose from. That was a, a thrill. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you end up, you know, when you're selecting a piano, when you have those options, what, do you, what are you personally looking yeah. for in a piano? Yeah, it's really interesting, um, especially because it was, uh, do you see you're looking for a beautiful tone color? Mm -hmm. You're looking for, uh, obviously, that the action works well, though they can regulate that sort of thing. Um, just something personal, some sort of connection that you have. Uh, the, the person who was in charge of setting me up with the instruments uh, said to me, I'm not going to tell you anything about these instruments. I'm not going to tell you which one is, is a German Steinway, which one is an American New York Steinway. And I'm not going to tell you which other artists have chosen these instruments because mm -hmm. I don't want to in influence you in any way. So you just sit with these instruments for as long as you need. So what I did at the end was I took a picture of me with the, the instrument that I'd chosen. I, I put the other lids down and I, and I said, could you take a picture of me playing? Well, he, he threw me for quite a loop uh, about two months later. He sent me an email and he said, uh, somehow I, I lost track of which instrument you selected. And I kind of chuckled and <laughs> almost wrote back, well, I, it looks like you're going to be flying me back to New York to reselect. <laughs> but I did find this picture and I said, I think maybe this picture might help you. And he said, oh, I know exactly which instrument. It was actually a, a, a German Steinway. Which is fascinating because my Steinway in my office at Kent State and my Steinway at home are both uh, American New York Steinways. Mm -hmm. But somehow I gravitated towards this German Steinway. Yeah, maybe it was good per for the purpose of the <laughs> recording. So you already kind of gave some insight into how you arrived at the concept for the album. You know, when you go and you, you know, did you have almost pretty much complete control over the concept or did you have people working with you or was this kind of your own? The concept, the concept was was completely my own, mm -hmm. completely my own. Um, so I guess I have I have that to um, <laughs> acknowledge if, it, if if for some reason it fails. But <laughs> no, it was my concept. It was my idea. Um, but I had to sell it. I had to get mm -hmm. the label to go for it. I had to get um, uh, the recording engineer to want to sign off on it. Everybody seemed to feel that it was an interesting idea. Of course. Uh, you know, GBC's complete solo piano music has been recorded many times over, so the idea of putting together selected work seemed to be appealing. Yeah. Very good. Well, I'm excited to, to hear it. I know they have a preview video online. Yes. Um, we're kind of a trailer for the album, so yes. if, you know, people want to see that, they're yeah, absolutely, absolutely welcome absolutely. to. Um, and, you know, now, even looking even further forward, we also have a Kent Keyboard series yeah. at Kent State. Um, and I know you're performing in January, but there's five performances total. Um, so what, who's, on the, who's first on the series this year? First performer is a gentleman by the name of uh, Scott Holden, who actually was a classmate of mine at uh, Manhattan School of Music. Um, fantastic pianist. He's a professor at uh, Brigham Young University. Mm. And uh, we're looking forward to, to hearing him. He, he played on the series my very first year. It was the 2003-2004. The King Keyboard Series is, is the brainchild of uh, my colleague, uh, Donna Lee. Mm -hmm. She began the series, I think, about a year or two before I arrived on the faculty. And uh, so each of us always are, are one of the two performers. Yeah. And then uh, Chu Fang Huang, who was actually a winner of the Cleveland International Piano mm -hmm. Competition, so she's a, a favorite of audiences here in Northeast Ohio. Absolutely. She lives partly in, in China and partly in New York City. She's coming, will offer a, a, an amazing program. And then uh, Sandra Shapiro uh, from the Cleveland Institute of Music faculty will also be featuring a program. It's, hers is a very special uh, idea. She says that these are works that were somehow inspired by her father mm. who passed away when she was quite young. And so I think she'll be filling us in a little bit more on how these particular pieces came together. Yeah, 
That sounds like, you know, when you and Donna have to put this together, because you have to work, you know, it's, it's a two-member uh, department, so you have to work quite closely with yes. each other very often. You know, when you're selecting these artists, what do, you, what do you kind of, what's your process for agreeing to dates and getting that? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy process. I mean, part of it is um, uh, throughout the year we get requests. Mm -hmm. So, you know, either friends of ours or colleagues from around the country, but, but also people that we don't know will say, you know, could I perform on, on the series? And so we have to kind of look through those and see which would be a good, a good fit. Um, and uh, there are certain people that we know we know would give spectacular performances. We know that our audience would react well to them. Yeah, and, uh, it's it's a thrill when it all comes together. It's it's very exciting. Yeah, I'm you know I'm really excited for this season. I've you know <laughs> since I'm the one <laughs> making a lot of the promotional materials, yes. it looks like a fantastic yeah. season. It's going to you know some incredible artists. You know, and people who have I think a very either a deep connection to. Um, you and Donna, or you know, also to Northeast Ohio, yes. both Sandra Shapiro yes. and Chu yeah. Feng. Um, I think it's it's just going to be an absolutely fantastic season, and we'll have more out about that uh, soon, so people can find more at kent.edu/music/events. Um, and there's actually a link right there for the Kent Keyboard Series. And right now the dates are up, and yes. the performers are up. We'll have more information out, probably you know, in definitely by the time people are viewing this in August. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Thank yeah. you for keeping up with us as we as all of this evolves. Yeah. yeah. So where can people find more information about you online? I have my own website, uh, Jerry Wong, W-O-N-G Piano.com, Jerry Wong Piano.com, and I, I keep a list of upcoming performances. There's some um, pictures from various events, uh, more uh, YouTube clip videos of, of performances. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Until next time, everyone.